okay? Because your assignment's due in, in, it's due in two weeks today, okay? The 11th of the 11th, okay? So, the date to remember. Um, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about authentication. And because I realise that there's so much work to do for this and people are struggling, we're going to have next week's lecture as a guest a guest visitor, I'm hoping. I'm trying to get a guest visitor in. So basically, this will be the last week of, of stuff for your assignment. Okay? Because I don't want to give you stuff right up to the last minute. I'd rather give you a chance to finish off the assignment and do a good job. So we're going to talk about authentication today. And we're going to talk about simple authentication mechanisms. <coughs> so we're going to discuss the idea of authentication and authorization. Okay, the key difference between the two. And you need to understand that to build your web service. We're going to look at how we configure the database for authentication. So I'm going to give you some, some pointers and some examples to help you out a little bit. We are, I'm going to look at the process of creating accounts. I won't show you the exact process. I won't show you step by step. What I will show you is the, things you have to, the steps you have to go through in order to achieve it. I'm assuming that your database skills are relatively okay for this. I'm not going to spend too long on database stuff. I'm going to focus my efforts on the, the REST side. We're going to look at how logins are handled, how we handle login requests, and you saw this a bit with the Bookshop API. We're going to look at how we secure the web service itself, how we check to see if someone's logged in or not. And we're going to look at alternate authentication mechanisms. Okay, which you may wish to look at for those higher grades. You may wish to sort of expand your, um, your options here. So the difference is absolutely critical. Authentication is the question, are you allowed to be logged onto the system? That's what authentication is. So when you log on to the university system, you're authenticated against Active Directory that says you have a login on the system, you're allowed to log in. Authorization, on the other hand, is once you're logged in, what are you allowed to do? Now, who, someone was talking about that for this web service because they were saying for ordinary use, they want to be able to add and move uh, reviews and add, author, add um, films and add genres and so on. Yeah? But um, if you think about it, an admin person will need to maybe delete films or edit the film titles or do, do more. So for those higher grades, you might want to think about the different types of user that's going to be accessing your system. So you might have one set of authorization criteria for ordinary users and different authorization for admin people or super users. That's one way to go for those higher grades is to understand the difference between the two. <coughs> you don't need that to pass this assignment. That is simply going to be if you want to go for the distinction, go want to go for the, um, the sort of the first class two one side of things. So if you want to really push things. Um, so authentication authorization is important, but as far as your, your, the core part of this assignment goes, it's not a core part of the assignment. The core part of the assignment is to create a web service which you can then use in your second and third and so on in your assignments. Now, I put my hands up to this one. When I show the Bookshop API is actually quite old and it, it dates from before REST was really fully defined. So when I did the authentication for the bookshop, I did what's called a REST RPC hybrid. It wasn't pure REST. So I've deleted the old version completely, so I wasn't tempted to go back to it. And I've rewritten the bookshop API from the ground up. So it uses pure REST procedures and pure REST uh, authentication. <coughs> the important thing is, there should be no session data on the server. None whatsoever. So we can store the user accounts on the server, we can store the usernames and the passwords, obviously encrypted, their names and so on, but we mustn't store whether they're logged in or not. That must not be on the server. Okay, so that creates a huge challenge, doesn't it? How do we let someone access resources if the server doesn't know if they're logged in or not? And the answer is, every request from the client has to contain all the information it needs to authenticate and authorise and do the job. Do you understand what I'm saying? In other words, we've got to send a username and password in some form for every single request we make for a secure resource. Because if we make a request and send our username and password, it, it authorizes you, it authenticates you, it sends the data back. Two seconds later, you send another request, it has no idea who you are. 
it has a goldfish memory. Yeah, there is no state on the server at all. The downside is you have to keep passing that username and password onto the system. The good news is it scales perfectly. This system will scale infinitely. You could have one request going to a server in Hong Kong and it sends a response back. The next request will go somewhere in the US, in California, and it sends a request back. Because it's not storing the session state on the server, it doesn't matter which of the servers you go to, you can still get the information you need and authenticate. And that's why we do it, because if you think about uh, Facebook, for instance, imagine if every logged in user had to have a session stored on their servers. There could be half a billion users on Facebook. Imagine every server around the globe would have those, have those half a billion profiles and half a billion sessions stored in RAM for this to work. It just not, it doesn't scale, does it? And that was one of the limitations of the old RPC SOAP style rest web services. You had to have all that session data on the server. It worked beautifully for a small company or a large company, but it didn't scale globally. So we're going to, make sure, we're going to implement a pure REST authentication mechanism. <clears throat> so there are two pure stateless authentication mechanisms we can choose from. The first one is HTTP basic, which is what I'm teaching you today. An alternative is HTTP digest. And if you want to go for the first class 2.1, the really high grades for this, you might want to look at having a go at implementing HTTP digest authentication. That's a challenge for those of you who want to really push the boundaries on this. But for the sake of this lecture, I'm going to focus on HTTP basic. The documentation for digest is there's, there's loads of it. There's examples in PHP of how it works in PHP. If you really want to do it, you'll find, you'll find the answers quite quickly. The alternative is what we did with the old bookshop. We had a token-based system. And with a token-based system, you send the username and password to the server. The server generates a special token, an encrypted token, stores the token somewhere on the server, and sends the token back to the user. And then every request you make, you simply send that token through to the server. The advantage of that is you can control things like um, uh, um, token limits, login limits. So you can set a timer, a timeout on that token so it expires after a certain amount of time. With the, with the HTTP basic authentication and digest, the timeout is controlled by the client. If you build an app, an iPhone app, you as the developer of the iPhone app would control how long the login should last for, not the, um, not the server. <coughs> The downside is you have to store those tokens on every single server in your system. So it means you've got to replicate these tokens across the, all the systems. So whichever system someone goes to, it recognizes that token. So that's why we tend to avoid token-based authentication for pure REST, because it puts an extra load on the server. Um, to simple token-based is used in password to get passed in, it generates a token, it sends the token back, and then it uses that token the alternative is something called OAuth. And you've come across OAuth before. OAuth is a two-stage process. You know when, you, uh, when you're on your, your phone or your, uh, another website and you want to link via Facebook? And you click in and you click on the Facebook link and it pops up a Facebook screen, doesn't it? It says, this app wants to access your contacts. That's OAuth in action. The problem with simple token base is let's imagine your web service becomes really popular and someone wants to embed it in their website. To log into your system, you've got, someone's got to type the username and password into someone else's website, haven't they? To be, able to, to be able to authenticate. Which means it goes through an untrusted domain. With the idea of OAuth is when someone tries to log in, the user gets passed forwarded to, say, the Facebook site. And when you log in, it generates two tokens. One goes back to you, and the other one goes to the other website. So every time you make a request through the website, two tokens get passed through. And that way, it avoids you having to type your, user, your Facebook details into someone else's web page, but allows the two systems to integrate. So I would use OAuth in a situation where you want to embed your web service in other people's websites or apps. That's the perfect example of how to do it. There is OAuth, and there's OAuth 2. OAuth 2 is less secure than OAuth 1, but it's understandable. The average human being can figure out how it works. 
OAuth was really complicated, so people didn't use it. So you need to think about how your web service is going to be used by the end user. But for this assignment, HTTP Basic is absolutely fine to get through the assignment. So stateless authentication. Okay. Key here is the only security you have for your login systems is SSL. You know, the encryption between the server and the client, the little padlock. So normally, if you were doing this for real, for a real website, you'd have to make sure that the website has a certificate, has an SSL certificate installed. Because without that SSL certificate, you're sending your username and password in, almost in virtual plain text across the network, which is obviously very dangerous. It can be sniffed, it can be retrieved, it can be hacked. So when we do the third assignment, you're going to be building your own web server you're going to be, as part of that assignment, you're going to be installing SSL, uh, SSL encryption on your web server because it's so important. So <coughs> that's something to be aware of. The one you're doing at the moment, do not use your, username, your university username and password while you're testing your system out because it is not very secure. <coughs> on the server, to get this working on the server, you require one table, one more database table. You need to store usernames and passwords. Makes sense, doesn't it? So there's a database table somewhere in your system which stores, well, at least usernames and passwords, possibly names, email addresses, contact details, you know, all the usual user stuff. A profile picture. But the bare minimum, you need a username and a password. So you can get the whole of the authentication systems uh, working with one table and two record, and two, um, well, three of an ID and three fields. So it's a very simple mechanism. <coughs> now, so the server role is to store the usernames and passwords. The client role in your authentication, it needs to store whether the user is logged in. Now you think about this, if you're sending the username and password for every request, you don't want the user to have to type in the username and password every time they, they access your service. So in the client, you expect someone to, to have a login box, wouldn't you? A login form to type in the username and password, to test that against the web service to make sure it's valid, and then to store it somewhere in cookies or somewhere persistent and inside the app. So you're storing the username and password inside the client app. You, you understand what we're saying here? So every time you make a request from your app, it would simply retrieve the username and password and use that to make the request. And of course, the session expiry is dead easy. All you've got to do is delete the username and password that's stored in your app. As soon as you delete that username and password, they can't access the system. They've got to log in again. So you control the session duration and if they're logged in or not. And which means you're going to have to build some resources on your web service to handle these sort of requests. So, for example, if the user logs in, as soon as they put the username and password in and click on log in, gentlemen, it's quarter past nine. You are late. Why? Train problems, getting earlier train. Hey, any other problems? Getting out of bed problems in the mornings? Next week that door will be locked at 10 past. Okay, I'm doing it for this one session, I'll leave it a bit longer, because obviously you could argue I didn't tell you, but I'm telling you now, all right? 10 past, it finishes. Anyone walks in after 10 past next week, we stop the camera, we stop the recording, and we'll just go back to the old fashioned way. So, client role is are they logged in and when will the session expire? Now, where was I? Okay, so when the person types the username and password into your login form, you need to have a resource which simply tests those credentials and returns true or false, don't you? Because if it's wrong, you need to pop a message in the login box saying incorrect password. It, doesn't, it just needs to return about 10 bytes of data, doesn't it? Yes or no, true or false. So that's something you need to think about. And if you don't think about it now, you will certainly think about it in the next assignment when you try and build your login box and you realise it's missing. 
So the requirements of your web service, when someone creates an account, you think about when you, when you do a form to create an account, you need a very quick way to see if your username's still there, don't you? If your username's available. So that could just be a simple request response saying, we, uh, we send the request contains the username they want, and response come back, comes back true or false. So a very quick mechanism to test if a username's been already been used. We need, obviously need to be able to add a, add a new user account, don't we? Which is gonna be what, post or put? It'll be put. Little voice put, said put down there. Why put? Who determines the, U, the uh, um, URI? The client, because you choose the username, don't you? And the chances are it's gonna be using slash username slash, and then the username. So if you remember, if you determine the username on the client, it's always put. If the server determines the, the, the URI, it's put. If the server determines the URI, it's post. So we need some form of put resource, or put to resource to generate an account. And then finally, like I've just been talking about, we need a very quick mechanism to handle, is this token valid? So we can create a nice login form for the user. <coughs> So the account creation process, two steps, isn't it? Does the account exist already? Create the account, two steps in the API. The login process though, let's see how login goes. So there's our app, our Android app that we built or, web J or uh, mobile web app. So we have to generate an OAuth token. An OAuth token? An OAuth token even, sorry. So in other words, we need to ask the user for their username and their password. We need a box that pops up on the screen to determine the username and password. Once we've got that, we send a quick request, is that token valid? Okay. If it's valid, we store that token as a cookie, as an NS user default, as a plist, as any sort of mechanism that you have inside your, uh, inside your client. And then every time we want to modify a resource, we simply attach the token we stored to that request. And that's how we do the login process. So even though you're simply designing a web service at the moment, at the back of your mind, think about the next assignment. Think about how it's going to be used by the, by the end user. So basic, basic HTTP. <coughs> <coughs> it's so basic, that's why it's called basic. We send a special token with every single request to modify a resource. What we do is we create a string from the username and the password. It's username, colon, password. So we, we concatenate a string together, and then we base64 encode it, which we'll talk about in a minute. So we turn it into a special token. And then we simply pass the token in the request header under authorization, the under authorization key. And the Bookshop API now implements that properly, so you can see that in action. And all Base64 is, and you might find this incredibly useful, big hint, for your, uh, for your web service, you can encode anything as ASCII text. You can even encode videos, photographs, audio files, WAVs, MP3s. You can turn any binary data into a stream of ASCII alphanumeric characters which means you can, you can actually upload these files through your web service mechanism. That's how, um, that, that's how these web services, how these, these apps, think about the, you know, the, the, the uh, photograph apps. You take photographs, you share the photographs. It takes the photograph, it base64 encodes the JPEG image and uploads it in the request body. Yeah. Okay, you see how that works? So you can send absolutely anything. Um, we worked on the Shakespeare app and we were encoding videos, 720 HD videos. I mean, there were huge files. It took a long time to upload them, but it worked. And then on the server, you have a base64 encode function to encode it, and then you can base64 decode on the server and turn it back into a video or a, a binary file. So base64 is used both for your token generation, but also if your web service requires you to upload photographs, for example, your profile picture, you can use Base64 to encode the, the uh, profile pictures. It's a very, very powerful uh, thing. 
So here we are. Here's the uh, token process. We create a string, username colon password. So there's the example, jdo colon p455w0rd, because obviously it's very secure. And, and then we run it through a base64 function. And to, for testing purposes, if you search for base64 encoding, there's loads of websites where you can just paste things in and it generates the, uh, the token. And that is the base64 encoded version of that username colon password. And then we send that through. In the header, we have a parameter called authorization with a Z. And we simply attach our token. So that's how we test using our authentication, our authorization. <clears throat> so once we've done that, we need to capture that data on the server, don't we? We need to capture the data, extract the username and password out of it to make sure they're valid usernames and passwords. So before we do that, we're going to modify just one table, in fact. We're going to create a users table. And the important thing about the users table is we store personal details, we store the username, and we store the password. There are various, you should encrypt the passwords, you always encrypt the passwords. Uh, we're sticking to MD5 encryption. I know it's not the most secure, but it's quick and easy. SHA1 would be a better option if, you, if, you, uh, if you've got more time. But MD5 is fine for, for demonstration purposes. We take the username, we store that in the users table. We take the password, we encrypt the password, and MD5 is a one-way encryption, you can't decrypt it. We turn it into a 64-character string, and we store that in the table. So this is how our table looks. Well, it would look if it hadn't gone off the bottom of the screen. Can you just about make that out at the bottom? So there's an example, name, email, and password. Can you see this long string, the password? That's the MD5 string that we're storing, which means if someone hacks your database, they can get the usernames out of the system, but it's very, very difficult to get the original passwords out because the passwords are encrypted. <coughs> I'll say there'll be people, for, you know, if the ethical hacking security guys would, would scream at me at this point and say, MD5, it's not, it's, not, it's not totally secure. It's good enough for what we're doing. SHA1, better, MD5, easy. So there's my um, users table, uh, name, email, password. And I've got a little extra thing called validated, which is a basic Boolean. Because you know how sometimes it sends you an email when you create an account and you have to click on the email to confirm? All you do, you put a, a little Boolean flag in your users table, set it to false, and as soon as you click on the email link, the page they go to just sets the flag to true. And that's validated the account, isn't it? It's validated the email address. Natural pause in the proceedings. So that's okay. So creating an account. <coughs> So basically, the way we're doing it for the, for the basic assignment here <coughs> is we simply allow people to create an account and that's it. Realistically, you want to validate the accounts, don't you, to make sure the accounts aren't using sort of dodgy emails or you know, they're, they're real people to avoid spam issues. So there's two main methods you can use. The first one is <coughs> you generate an email which gets sent out to the user at the email address they specified with a link in it, and the link simply takes them to a PHP script which sets the flag to true, to show that the email account is okay, or you only allow admins to a create or validate accounts. Okay, there's your two options there. Okay, so when we create a new user, this is in case you haven't come across the MD5 function before, in MySQL there's an, there's an MD5 function. So you can insert, you haven't got, you can generate the MD5 hash in SQL. And you'll find this useful as well when you come to validate the user because you can obviously encrypt whatever they've typed in and compare it against the database. So MD5 function is very, very useful. So this is the hard bit. How do we validate the user? How do we carry out the authentication on that user? Well, there's actually four steps involved. You first of all have to retrieve the token from the header. That's obvious, isn't it? This, this, uh, this um, uh, base64 encoded token. So you need to retrieve the token. <coughs> you then need to base64 decode the token, which gives you a string, username, colon, password. You need to split the string to extract the two values. 
and then you need to look those values up in your users table to see if they're a valid user. So it's a full step process. This is how we access the token. We first of all retrieve the request headers. So we've got the headers now from the, uh, from the request and then the headers is basically a dictionary, key value pairs. Think about it, you've got the name and the value, haven't you, when you added the values into your head and body. So all we say is, first of all, we see if it's empty, yeah, which means they've left it blank. They've either put authorization and left the value blank or they've just left it out completely. If it's not blank, then you know there's a value in there. And you can retrieve it. Dollar headers authorization will give you that encoded string. So you've now got a way of getting that encoded string so you can, you can start the, authoriz the uh, authentication process. Then we have to base64 decode it to extract that original string. Because base64 is obviously a two-way process. You can encode and decode. And obviously, if you decide to upload images to the server, do the same thing, can't you? You can, de you can decode your image data your photographs, your videos, your audio files. So base64 decode gives you a string and then we use the explode function in PHP. What the explode function does, it splits a string into an array based on whatever character you specify. So in this one we've got, um, you can see we've got the colon there. We explode the string on the colon and rather than create an array I'm using the special list command which says the first index will get put in that variable and the second bit after the colon will get in that variable. So I'm splitting it into two automatically. So I've now got dollar username and I've got dollar password, which means I can now look those up in the system, can't I? So let's just recap where we've got to so far. Your assignment API, you need to check to see if your username has been taken. Okay, that mechanism should be in place, otherwise you'll find the second assignment very, very difficult. <coughs> you need to have some form of mechanism for creating a new account, obviously. You need to have a simple mechanism to very quickly test a username-password combination to make sure they're valid. And you need to then add some code to all your unsafe methods. There was any method that will change the systems on the server needs to have authentication, apart from creating an account, obviously, because that's no, you can't do it without an account. So adding new um, new reviews, deleting reviews, adding new films, um, rating films, all those unsafe methods need to have need to be protected from unauthorized access. And for the assignment. The minimum requirements for your assignment is that you implement basic HTTP basic authentication. That's the minimum requirements to pass the assignment. That will get you a middling grade. 